Amen. Now, during recent weeks, the children of Israel, we've heard how the children of Israel wanted a king. Because the children of Israel wanted to be like all the other nations. And we heard how in chapter 8, the Lord said to Samuel, Obey the voice of the people, for they have rejected me for being king over them. Obey their voice, only solemnly warn them of the ways of the king who shall reign over them. And so Samuel warned them. And when, for when God's people turn away from God as king and seek to become just like everybody else, the outcome is never good. But the people said, no, there shall be a king over us that we may be like all the other nations. The people had rejected God, but in his mercy, God gave them a king. And as Andy showed us last week in chapter nine, the man God chose to be king was Saul. And so as we come to the start of 1 Samuel 10, we find Samuel in verse 1 taking a flask of oil and pouring it on Saul's head to anoint him prince over his people Israel. Now, all of this must come as quite a surprise to Saul. After all, who among us would not be surprised if this happened to us? And God knew that Saul would need a great deal of assurance that God had indeed chosen him for this task. And so God provides Saul with ways that he will feel assurance. God gives Samuel a detailed list of things which will happen to tell to Saul so that Saul will know that God has def definitely chose him. A sign to you that the Lord has anointed you to be prince over his heritage. And these predictions were extremely detailed and precise. And amazingly, all of these detailed signs came true exactly as Samuel predicted they would. Two men would meet Saul near, near Rachel's grave with a message about some donkeys being found, and they did. And then three men would meet Saul at the Oak of Tabor. One would have three young goats, one would have three loaves of bread, one would have a skin of wine, and then the bread man would give Saul two of his loaves. And it all happened. The fulfillment of such detailed predictions could only have come from God. And so through the fulfillment of these signs, God gave Saul assurance that God, God did indeed, had, he had indeed given Saul his authorization for kingship. Now, we all need assurance from time to time, don't we? Some things are extremely clear from God's word. We should love other people. We should be kind. We should not keep a record of wrongs. We should not be proud. But sometimes things happen which leave us a bit bewildered. And at those times we need God's assurance. And I'll never forget the time when I needed God's assurance. And in an extremely detailed and precise way, like only he can, he gave me the assurance I needed for he is a gracious God and he knows what we need. But let's look at the balance within the message to Saul because it's important. Saul is to receive both the power of the spirit and direction of the, th from the word through Samuel. Verse six, the spirit of the Lord will rush on you and then in verse 8, go down before me to Gilgal, 
seven days you shall wait until I come to you and show you what you should do. You see, Saul the king, who is promised God's power, is supposed to submit to God's word through Samuel. God's spirit brings power, but that power should be exercised only in obedience to God's word. The spirit and the word should never be separated. It's been a great blessing to sit under the ministry of some wonderful Christian leaders who've been anointed and who've moved graciously in the gifts of the Spirit. But they've all taught that God's Spirit will never contradict his own word. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Why do you call me? Lord, Lord, and do not do what I tell you. What makes us think we can enjoy the Lord's power, his presence, his blessing, if we deny his lordship by trampling on his word? And this is something that the church needs to remember in the 21st century. For these are challenging times. What the world wants is moving further and further away from what God's word clearly says. And we hear church leaders saying, let's follow where the spirit is leading. But as leaders come forward with visions of how they think the church should be in the future, we should weigh very carefully what they say with God's word. For God's spirit will never contradict his word. All spirit, all scripture is breathed out by God. Now the instructions of verse eight, which includes the words, seven days you shall wait, will prove important in the life of Saul, as we will discover in a few weeks time. But we don't like waiting, do we? We find it hard. We get impatient. Maybe it's waiting for some sort of operation, which means enduring pain while we wait. Maybe it's waiting for a new vicar. And although it looks like the cogs of the system might be moving a bit now, it may be a while yet before we have a share of a new vicar here in Foy. But although waiting is frustrating, we must never lose sight of the fact that our Lord is invariably at work during the waiting times. And our Lord has been at work here in our midst in Foy in ways which maybe we don't appreciate for example, how many of you here this morning, three years ago, would just come and sit in a pew on a Sunday morning? But now you are involved in the ministries of this church in a number of ways. You see, everybody's role here is important. What everybody does here is valued and it's been really wonderful to see more and more people coming forward to lead on our Thursday evening prayer meetings and as a church we've discovered new ministries ask Maggie about the prayer requests and the prayer tree and I hope you'll also agree that as a church we've grown closer together as a church family. Saul may have had to wait, and waiting time is tiresome, but waiting can also have its benefits. Well, Saul was not just going to be 
assured by God he had been chosen as king, Saul was going to be equipped too. In verse 9, God gave him another heart. And when they came to Gibeah, the spirit of God rushed on him and he prophesied. For when God calls us to a task, he equips us for what he wants us to do for him. But when Saul started prophesying, the people who knew Saul were surprised. What has come over the son of Kish? Is Saul also among the prophets? For God frequently defies human expectations and gives the most unlikely people the gifts and the graces they need to serve him effectively. And you know, the thing is, we all tend to judge by appearances, don't we? And Saul, he just didn't look like a prophet. Maybe a film star, for we hear he was extremely good looking. Maybe a basketball player, because we read that he was absolutely enormous. But a prophet? Is Saul also among the prophets? Now, those of you who've been in Cornwall for a long time may remember the name of the Reverend Peter Bolt. Now, Peter is no longer with us. Peter is with the Lord in glory. But Peter was the most effective evangelist among teenagers that I have ever met. To look at him, you'd never have thought it. Peter was not in the slightest bit trendy. When I met him, he was middle-aged and he used to wear this old grey suit and he knew absolutely nothing about youth culture. And I don't think he would mind at all if I told you that, well, Peter looked pretty insignificant and he had some musical ability, but the Lord gave him enough to set up and lead two very large youth choirs, the first in Truro in the 70s and then in Plymouth in the 80s. He wasn't a dynamic public speaker either, but Peter loved Jesus. And he walked closely with Jesus. And the Lord gave Peter all the gifts and all the graces he needed to lead scores and scores and scores of teenagers to Christ. No matter how unlikely we may appear in men's eyes. And no matter how unlikely we may appear in our own eyes, if God has a task for us, he will make us able. And if the Lord has a task for you, he will make you able too. Now Saul's uncle asked Saul, What's been going on? What did Samuel say to you? But we read that about the matter of the kingdom of which Samuel had spoken, Saul did not tell him anything. And you see throughout chapter 9, which Andy spoke about last week and the first half of chapter 10, hardly anybody really knows what's going on. It's as if there's this conspiracy of mystery. But in the light of all the secrecy, there's this verb, massa, which means to find, which occurs an incredible 12 times in this episode. And isn't it odd to find the repeated use of a verb, which means basically to find, in a section where nobody seems to know what's going on? You see, donkeys are found. People are found. 
opportunities are found. And so is the kingdom. God is actively at work. But few see what he's actually doing. My friends, God is actively at work and his church. But a lot of what he's doing is concealed for now. But in time, what he is doing will be made clear. We need to trust in him. Well, the time came for everything to be revealed. For The time came for Saul to be proclaimed king. And so in verse 17, we read that Samuel called the people together to the Lord at Mizpah. And then something unexpected happens. Instead of proclaiming welcome to this happy and joyous occasion when we all gather together here to appoint Israel's first king. Samuel says to the people, verse 19, you said to God, set a king over us. Today, you have rejected your God who saves you. Ouch. Samuel had already made this point to the people in chapter 8. But Samuel repeats it again here. For God's word is relentless. God's word will not stop. My friends, no matter how hard the world may try to silence God's word, no matter how governments may try, no matter how hard people who control communications might try, no matter how pressure groups might try, they cannot silence the word of God. And even as we look forward to years to come, those who si try to silence the word of God will never succeed for the word of God cannot be silent. We live in a world where people don't like being offended, don't we? And some even think it's their right not to be offended or to feel offended. But sometimes the truth just needs to be spoken. And when I was 17, the Reverend Peter Bolt, who I told you about earlier, spoke the most important words to me that anyone ever said. He was very direct. He looked me right in the eye and he said, the trouble with you, Paul, is you don't know Jesus. And you know, some might have found it offensive to have those words said to them. But you know, I didn't. Because I knew deep down inside that he was telling the truth. I knew he was being honest with me. And he was being honest with me for my own good, even at the risk, the risk of offending me. And here, Samuel is faithful to God rather than cordial to the people. And maybe there's a lesson there for us as individuals. And maybe there's a lesson for us there as church in what we say to our nation. There are risks in calling a spade a spade. But I will be eternally grateful to the Reverend Peter Bolt for taking that risk of being honest with me. Because I know that the truth he spoke directly to me has eternal significance. Because the truth he spoke to me contained the keys 
to eternal life. Well, back to this passage, the children of Israel cast lots to establish who had cho- God had chosen to be king. And so was God's clear choice. But look, when they sought him, he could not be found. How ironic. <coughs> How ironic. <coughs> Here were people who had rejected God as king. But when God gave them a king, they had to ask God where their king was. How dependent they were on God. But they just couldn't see it. How dependent we are on God. How dependent society is on God. But somehow just can't see it. And so in verse 22, they inquired again of the Lord. And the Lord said, behold, he has hidden himself among the baggage. The commentators that I've read have been very kind to Saul. Maybe he lacked self-confidence. Maybe he felt overwhelmed may be humbled, and all that may well be true. But you know, in my mind's eye, when I picture that mountain of a man who had just been chosen to be Israel's first king, hiding away among the suitcases, Do I describe the picture which I see as comical or do I describe it as tragic? And all the people shouted, long live the king. How foolish we are. How foolish mankind is to put our trust in men instead of in God, for humans will always let us down, no matter how wonderful we think they are. The visionary, the politician, the Christian hero, they'll all let us down. I know I will let you down because I am a weak and frail human being. And hopefully, one day, we will have a share of a vicar here in Foy. But, you know, inevitably, at some stage, we will feel that he has let us down too, in one way or another. You see, my friends, what the people of Israel couldn't see is the only one who would never let them down is God. He was the one Samuel was talking about when he said, you've rejected the God who saves you. He was the one the Reverend Peter Bolt was talking about when he said, the trouble with you, Paul, is you don't know Jesus. For they are one and the same God. For he is God who became flesh and went to a cross and died in our place so that in him we may find forgiveness of our sin. And he is God who is risen. He is God who is alive and we can trust in him completely. We can depend on him completely. We can rely on him completely, for he will never let us down. And my prayer is, if you do not do so already, that you will trust in him. And that you, if you do not do so already, will know him too. Praise his holy name.
Amen.